Hello students and welcome to another module of Pwn College. Today we're going to be talking about race conditions. Uh, race conditions are um, deeply grounded in the concept of time. So first let's talk about time. All right. As uh, Albert Einstein uh, put it, time is basically a dimension across which we can lay out events to separate them temporally. Right. If you think about time um, in terms of your own personal experience. Um, taking this class, for example, you might wake up, you might eat, work on Pwn College, eat, work on Pwn College, eat, work on Pwn College, sleep. Um, and this is separated along the axis of time, right? So that's your human experience. A process has a similar experience. A process executes uh, operations, performs operations in order. It'll initialize, then it might look at the input it's received, it might carry out some action on it, look at the next uh, amount of input, carry out more actions, and so forth, right? Um, this all makes sense. Now, what about two processes? Let's say you launch this pr program twice that initializes, checks input, does stuff, checks input, does stuff, and so on. To each process, they're internally ordered, right? And this makes sense. But in reality, these two processes, they execute in a single um, timeline, right? In the real world. And so they are necessarily interleaved. They get initialized, not at exactly the same time, but one of them will get initialized before the other. Um, one of them might check the environment impacts before the other and so on. They don't all execute exactly simultaneously, even if you launch them at the same time. Why is this? In the old days, this was because uh, computers had a single CPU, right? So um, you would uh, have one processor that could do one thing at a time, even on a multi-process system, uh, that processor would basically carry out the actions of one process then it would switch to another and so on. Nowadays we have multiple cores, but this um, kind of alleviates the issue. It helps things run more concurrently, but we still have, for example, more processes running on our machines than um, cores that can execute instructions, right? So uh, the kernel will still decide what to schedule at what point your, your, uh, process, uh, your processes as they run will still get interleaved. Um, Aside from uh, CPUs, the other parts of the hardware architecture on which your uh, programs run are also limited. Memory controllers, depending on the, the type of memory, etc., can um, maybe handle several uh, concurrent writes, but not very many, maybe in a high-end workstation 4. Um, your storage media is limited. An SSD can handle some amount of uh, kind of pseudo concurrent rights, but again, not many. Uh, networks, you know, on, on, on a network connection, pro uh, packets are sent in order. Um, and there's just no getting around that. It's a, it's a cable that has one packet going across at a time or a Wi-Fi signal that's uh, basically the same. Um, so the bottom, bottom line is that bottlenecks in the architecture underpinning our um, computing um, frameworks, our, our, our computing substrate basically requires these concurrent events to at least be partially serialized, right? So let's take a look at the implications of this. The implications of this are kind of dire, right? Because it basically means that unless your program um, or two programs or whatever have explicit dependencies on order of operation that they enforce, then uh, that execution order can will only be guaranteed within a single process. In reality, actually, this is within a single thread. And in reality, reality, as we'll discuss, even within a thread, there are corner cases that are uh, pretty tricky and can lead to a lot of um, bugs, right? Um, so, for example, let's look at some possible execution orders for, you know, simultaneous launches of the two processes we've been talking about. Um, one 
uh, order this perfect interleaving. It could happen. It likely won't happen. Likely there will be some messy interleaving. Um, but you can see the individual actions of every process within that process are ordered between the processes. There's no guarantee. So you might launch P1 and P2 and have their actions interleave perfectly. You might launch them and have P1 uh, get scheduled by the kernel, run all the way through, and then P2 get scheduled by the kernel, run all the way through. Um, you might have part of P1 run, then all of P2, then the rest of P1. You might have uh, part of P1, part of P2, then the rest of P1, then the rest of P2, and so on, right? Um, why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because certain execution interleavings can be buggy. In this case, imagine if P1 makes some assumptions or checks some critical information in uh, the check input function. Then uh, P2 does the same thing on an unchanged environment. So P1 and P2 checked the same environment, right? They might look at ownership of files, et cetera, et cetera. And then P1 carries out some action. The environment has now changed, but P2 is carrying out an action based on the environment that it checked before P1 changed that environment, right? This is called a time of check, time of use bug, right? This action that P2 has taken might no longer be valid, might no longer be safe because of changes that P1 carried out to um, the program state. And we're gonna look at an example in just a second. Of course, if you don't interleave them, if they happen to get scheduled one after the other, uh, in this case, no bug occurs. Uh, other interleaving uh, types have other issues. This one, um, P1's do action gets run after P2 does the check and action multiple times. The, this could be you know, massive changes to the environment potentially, but conceptually the same as one action. Um, here's an interesting one all the way to the um, right of the slide. Uh, here we have two problems. One is that P1's do action gets run after P2's, uh, P1 checks its input then the environment gets changed by P2 and then P1 does its action. But the opposite is also true. P2 checks its in input the second time around, right before P1 does its first action, uh, which might undo actions carried out by T P2 previously, and then P2 does its action. Um, depending on the program logic, anything could happen here. So let's take a look at one example. All right, I created a um, vulnerable application for you. Um, and this vulnerable application has a check input function and a do action function. The check input function reads a provided file name on the command line and make sure that the value in that file name is zero. And the do action will read in that value, increment it and write it back out, right? So if we uh, put in zero to this file, and then um, we run this on the file, it tells us it wrote a one, and it indeed wrote a one. And then if we run it again, this assertion fails and it won't increment it. Right? You can imagine an authenticated or a privileged level uh, uh, number being incremented and stored. All right, so this seems pretty good, right? Well, interestingly, if we run this on repeat, let's say, this is a shell script um, that'll just keep running this. All right, let's get rid of the errors. So now we're running this uh, on repeat. So here in a different window, if we cat out the num file, it's one if we write zero to it and we cat it out again, it's one as well. All right, so it tells us it wrote a one. Now, 
what could go wrong? Obviously, what could go wrong is if this check input runs, the file is has a zero um, in it, and between check input and do action, we open that file and we write a one, right, on a, in a different process. Let's give that a try. So we're gonna do another loop here. We're gonna read zero here. So this guy is now constantly running and writing ones. Okay, so it, it'll open that file, read in the zero and, and write the uh, one. And then in another process, in another window, we're gonna loop and write a one to it. Why are we writing a one here? Because what we're hoping to trigger is the loop that's writing a zero will write the zero then check input will run because this is all running in multiple processes so it can be interleaved by uh, the kernel however uh, the kernel wants to interleave it uh, based on its internal priorities so anyways we write a zero then check input gets run this pa uh, check passes and then we write a one and do action gets run and it reads in the file and increments it and ends up writing a two so we have our zero, uh, our zero loop is running, our one loop is running, and you can see rote two is uh, blinking, oops, is blinking by, if we just kill it, several times we wrote a two. All right. Interestingly, um, so, so this is obviously a violation of the intent of the program. The program is very clearly written with the intent of write, only writing a one, because this check makes sure that the file in there was a zero. All right, this is uh, an interesting example also because it has a race condition to get uh, against it, uh, itself. So if you run two of these in a loop, then eventually we'll get a situation where they'll each do a check input, they'll see that the uh, file is zero, and then they will each one will open the file and increment it, making it one, and then the next one will open the file and increment it, making it two. Let's take a look at how this will work. So um, we run this in one. Let's kill the other loops, they're killed. Okay, we run this in a loop, we run a second iteration of it in a loop. Okay. Boom. So this guy wrote a one and this guy aired out, didn't write anything. Let's just keep resetting this in a loop. Eventually we'll see someone writing a two. Okay, and I think, yes, wrote two. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so that's um, a race condition just between two iterations of the same program. Um, so it's, it's it, can be two uh, iterations of, of a vulnerable program racing against each other. Oftentimes, um, it is going to be two iterations, two different threads in a vulnerable program. We'll talk about that in a second. Sometimes it is one program racing against you on the command line doing other stuff in a different process. All right. Um, so, how do we exploit this, right? The general case, of course, you identify this um, unsafe concurrency, you uh, figure out where you need to inject an action, you figure out how to make um, this point as big as possible, how to make uh, increase your chances of uh, changing the state between the time where the program verifies it and the time where the program actually um, uh, does whatever action it is uh, it, it wants to do. And then you very carefully modify that state so that the, pro the action that the program is taking end up being in your benefit and the attacker's benefit. Through the rest of the module, we'll talk about how you'll do this and uh, talk about how you would protect software against these sort of problems. All right, real quick note about 
the history of race conditions. I always try to include a little bit of history, a little bit of historical context for all these problems. Um, race conditions were um, are a pretty old concept. Originally, they were discussed in a hardware context. You um, have um, 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 logic gates connected by wires, and there are signals flowing between them. And a race condition was literally a signal racing um, against another signal along two different wires. Um, these were explored um, by a number of people, including David Huffman, who is probably most famous for Huffman encoding. Um, but uh, aside from Huffman encoding, uh, he also wrote an entire PhD thesis that included a lot of work on race conditions and discussion of security, uh, critical or buggy, bug inducing race conditions versus safe race conditions, etc. Um, all the way back to 1954. So this is a very ancient topic, over 60 years old. Um, and through this module, you're going to get way more familiar with it than Huffman ever had a chance to. Good luck.